So, and welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to sunny San Juan in Puerto Rico. Uh, for those of you guys in Seattle, I know this was a uh, build as an in-person talk. Uh, so sorry to not be there in person, uh, but I actually already had this trip planned and it's really, really nice here. And I, <laughs> I really wanted to be here. So uh, I hope you can enjoy uh, the weather with me um, re remotely. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, so I am a staff software en engineer at Astronomer now. Um, yeah, so uh, they, uh, you know, I was at Datakin for about a year. Uh, and if you don't know, Astronomer uh, fairly recently acquired Datakin just uh, a few months ago. Uh, so yeah, uh, now part of the Astronomer family. Uh, prior to this, uh, I actually worked for many years at Amazon. Uh, so for those of you who are on the Amazon campus, uh, I was there for about nine years uh, working in a uh, retail space. Uh, so doing data analytics there. Uh, and then I also did a short stint at Cruise doing uh, analytics uh, for the self-driving uh, autonomous vehicles there. So I, I've done a lot of clickstream analytics. Um, mostly this is what I did at Amazon. Uh, I did A-B testing. Uh, I've done a lot of work in data catalogs and uh, query tools and libraries and things of that sort. Uh, so next slide, please. So I want to talk about uh, how to open, how to integrate with Open Lineage and Airflow and Spark. Uh, but first I wanted to talk a little bit about just why to, you, you want to integrate with Open Lineage. Uh, and so I'm going to do that with a short story. It's a detective story. So imagine that you're a data engineer at Us Cooks, right? That's a, it's a bleeding edge shared kitchens tech company where chefs and kitchen staff, uh, they rent space and time at shared kitchen spaces all around the world. They uh, share common ingredients, uh, common utensils, machinery, infrastructure for ordering and deliveries, right? All, um, automated inventory, that kind of stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Now, as the data guru, you're going to be the one in charge of all the things data. So when something goes wrong with uh, one of the company-wide dashboards, you are the first to be called in, right? So imagine today a business analyst has come to you first thing in the morning and screaming like a maniac because they found this graph, right? There's a huge drop in the orders. But wait, right? if there was some kind of an outage or something like that, they wouldn't be calling you, right? They'd be calling one of the back-end software engineers or an infrastructure engineer or, you know, really anybody else, not the data engineers, uh, next, please. So the analyst explains to you that the chart is actually just showing an order drop for a particular customer, right? Uh, but it's not one of the tenants, not one of the restaurants uh, that uses the platform. It's a wholesaler. So see, one of the ways that us cooks makes money is by advertising on behalf of wholesalers and manufacturers of ingredients and machinery, right? So imagine wholesalers will pay us to promote items that have certain ingredients or need to be prepared a certain way with certain tools or certain machines. And we can do this by promoting either to the kitchen tenants themselves or by finding dishes that require those ingredients or those preparation mechanisms and advertising those dishes to the end customers, right, the eaters. So imagine now the ads team has been asked to boost sales of products that use a particular kind of Spanish virgin olive oil that's imp imported by a company in California. And so they've come up with an experiment that's going to find and produce products that are prepared with this olive oil, and they launched the experiment last week. Uh, well, obviously the experiment has gone ter terribly wrong, right? So the analyst comes in and says, we need to stop the experiment. Figure out what's going wrong, right? Well, this is where you, the data engineer, comes in, right? We need years on social media. You should probably know by now. Uh, never to trust a graph that tells a straightforward story, right? A line in the graph with a step function change is usually the stuff of conspiracy theorists or somebody who's trying to sell you something, right? Means of twist is to figure out how to untangle those knots and figure out what's really going on under the hood, right? So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to question this graph, right? How is it made? Where did it come from? Right. So you start off by checking the typical sources, right? You look at the source code for the dashboard, you look at the query, you start querying the database directly, and everything that you see so far reflects what you see in the graph. So let's dig a bit further. Next, please. So to dig in, first we need to understand how us cooks sells meals on behalf of the tenant restaurants. 
right? Now, like any modern restaurant, we use data analysis to generate recommendation models for customers based on where they live, what kind of food they order, uh, who they're similar to, things like that. We use some run-of-the-mill metrics to determine recommendations. Um, next slide. It's things like uh, star ratings, right? The number of reviews, uh, the delivery time for the restaurants, uh, how often are uh, customers ordering the same things or coming back to the same restaurants, uh, are items on sale? We want to kind of boost those items up a little bit higher in the list, right? These are all standard things that, you know, you expect for off-the-shelf recommendations algorithms. Next slide. Now, of course, there are a lot of hurdles to generating good recommendations, right? One of the one of the things in restaurants would be like uh, restaurants actually never want to sell peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or sloppy joes, right? They want to sell something fancy. They want to sell an experience. And so uh, you end up with these like pate of roasted legumes uh, and whatever. And, you know, we need to actually figure out what that means in order to make good rest recommendations to the customers. If you're actually allergic to peanuts, uh, we don't want to sell you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich just because we couldn't figure out what it was. Now, and beyond that, uh, restaurants do things like they rebrand, uh, they change themes. Sometimes restaurants have rotating themes, right? They'll have like Mexican one month and Italian the next month and Asian the month after that. Uh, sometimes the same chef might open two different restaurants with slightly different themes. And we want to know as much as we can about the domain in order to be able to generate good recommendations. Next slide. Now, you've probably heard of Goodhart's Law, right? We see it in our workplaces all the time. Uh, people start working for the metric instead of uh, what the metric is supposed to be predicting. Next slide. A slightly less well-known maybe is uh, Campbell's Law, right? It's very similar, but it says that any measure that's used for decision-making is subject to corruption and is likely to corrupt the behaviors that it's supposed to be monitoring. Right. This is especially applicable to recommendations algorithms that can be gamed by the players. Think things like uh, search engine optimization, right? Newsfeed algorithms on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Uh, think about uh, your automated video plays on YouTube, right? Most of your social media recommendations probably aren't things you actually want to see. They're usually the items that did the best at gaming the metrics, things like clickbait. Next slide, please. Is that the uh, restaurant tenants have started to try to results or search results and recommendations to get their items to boost higher in the uh, in the recommendations, right? So we want to drive traffic to things like new restaurants. We want to show people highly reviewed restaurants, things uh, items that are up and coming, popular orders, right? And so restaurants have kind of responded by generating fake orders um, or leaving fake reviews, sometimes paying companies uh, to leave fake reviews for them on, on the website. Um, all right, and next slide. Of course, we want to protect the quality of our recommendations, so we have to figure out how to counter those attacks, right? So we come up with things like, uh, you know, menu item D Norm or menu item normalization, right? Uh, bot detection, fake order detection. How can, can we tell if uh, a customer is an actual real customer or if it was a paid customer or if a review came from uh, you know, a shop that sells fake reviews, things like that. Next slide. So the result of all this is we end up with a data dependency graph that kind of looks like this, right? You can kind of see uh, where there's menu item normalization. You can see where there's some bot detection going on. And then uh, up here, uh, kind of just left of center, you see the orders dashboard. And you can see all of the incoming arrows where it's reading from all of these different tables, uh, trying to show an accurate picture of what orders look like after it's stripped away all of the garbage. Now, depending on the size of the company and how new you are to the data team, all of this could take you anywhere from several minutes to several hours to figure out. And then after a while of querying the upstream data sources, next slide, you find the culprit. Ah, it's your own bot detection algorithms that are flagging extra orders as suspicious. Uh, there was actually no drop in orders just in the data that your analyst is seeing. And this happens all the time, right? I can't tell you how many times I've been paged by somebody who saw a blip in the data and freaked out, right? And usually there was nothing wrong with the website or the experiment or anything wrong with the customer experience. Sometimes it was a website programmer who 
stopped logging in as needed. Or sometimes uh, they refactored the code and actually uh, now what used to be one event is now three different events that all contain different pieces of information. Uh, and sometimes the bot detection team actually changed their uh, bot detection algorithm and started flagging uh, sessions as robots that didn't used to be robots, right? Um, this happens all the time. And next slide. Once you find the root cause, you can, you know, wave your hands like magic and poof, you fix the dashboard. And now you can actually see, if you look closely, there's a small increase in the orders graph, which is about what you would expect for a really successful experiment. Just a small change. Next slide. Now, if you've, uh, if you've ever seen a talk on Open Lineage, you've probably seen this, uh, this image before, right? Everybody, every company wants to be data-driven. Everybody wants to make decisions based on the data. But as we saw, it's impossible to make a good decision if you can't trust the data. And we used to say that bad data is actually worse than no data because with no data, you knew that you had nothing to go on. And so you were more careful. You started, you paid attention, right? But with bad data, you can try to justify bad decisions all day long. Uh, and and if, you, if you really want to be able to use the data to make good decisions, you have to be able to trust the data that you have, right? You have to know where did it come from? Uh, is it up to date? And is it correct? Next slide. And these problems just grow as organizations scale, right? Um, so I took this graphic here from the original data mesh post, which uh, if you're not familiar with the data mesh, it's uh, an architecture that treats the data really the same way a lot of companies treat microservices. Each team owns a problem space. They own uh, the creation and the serving of that data. They have SLAs on when that data is going to be available, but hey, they have APIs uh, that allow that data to be served to uh, consumers downstream from them. And it's a really a great way to scale an organization, especially when you have many data sets or many different mechanisms of generating data. But it does mean that nobody has a clear idea of where a data set that you depend on actually comes from. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so now I just want to get into a little bit about Open Lineage itself, about the spec and about the integrations. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So Open Lineage aims to be a very simple specification. Um, there's three core data models. Uh, we have jobs, runs, and data sets, and that's it. Uh, so jobs have inputs and outputs. Um, jobs and data sets are versioned. Uh, so every time you change the source code of a job or you change the inputs and outputs, every time you write to a data set, the version changes. Uh, runs are just executions of a job, right? So a, jo a run is always an execution of a specific version of a job running at a specific time, and it always reads a specific version of a data set and outputs uh, a specific version of a data set. Now, in addition to the three core models, um, we have facets. And facets are how we customize bits of information uh, that describe the core entity, right? And facets are very extensible, and they capture things like, uh, say, the schema of the data. Right, uh, the Git SHA of the source code of the job, uh, information about the cluster that the job is running on, uh, runtime arguments, and things like that. Right, and it's this facet facet model that helps keep Open Lineage really simple and at the same time very extensible. Next slide, please. Um, so jobs are hierarchical. Uh, so that means so jobs can have parents and jobs can have children. Uh, a job may have uh, zero or more inputs or outputs. Um, so parent jobs may have input, uh, zero or more inputs or outputs. Uh, child jobs usually will have at least one input or output. Uh, child jobs inherit the namespaces of the parent. Um, and so some, some examples of hierarchical jobs are, you know, for the airflow crowd, uh, DAGs, right? So a DAG will have tasks, multiple tasks. Uh, sometimes you have task groups inside of a DAG. And the task uh, always inherits the namespace of the DAG, and the task is always a child job of the DAG. Um, now, a task may end up kicking off a job that runs on a completely different uh, processing system, such as uh, Apache Spark, right? Maybe you have an Airflow DAG that um, 
you know, reads some data from Postgres, writes it out to GCS, and then kicks off a Spark job that reads the data from GCS and does some processing with it. That Spark job is then going to be a child job of the task that actually task itself is a child of the DAG. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the core facets that come with the open lineage back out of the box. Um, so for data sets, we have things like input or output statistics, right? We want to know how many records or how many rows, or how many bytes did we write uh, into the data set when, when it was created. Um, the schema of the data set itself uh, and the version of the data set if uh, the data store itself supports versioning. So for example, like uh, Iceberg or Delta, uh, we can collect the, the version information from the data store. Uh, jobs have uh, parents, as I mentioned, that is a, a facet, um, source code location, uh, the query plan for the job, uh, if it's a, if there's a query plan that's available, and maybe information about the job from source control. Uh, job runs or ex job executions can have the scheduled time, so the time that it was originally scheduled to start as opposed to the time that it actually started. Uh, it could have a query ID or a batch ID, uh, runtime parameters, and maybe some information about the cluster that it's running on. Next slide. So now I'd like to get into some details about uh, how to collect lineage. Uh, we'll start with Airflow, since this is the Airflow Summit, and then uh, I'll go on to Spark after that. Next slide. So there are a few different ways to integrate Airflow with Open Lineage, depending on the version of Airflow that you're actually using. Uh, so if you're still on Airflow 1.10, uh, you have to use the uh, Open Lineage Airflow DAG subclass. Uh, so that is, you actually have to modify your DAG source code to change the import to use uh, our subclass. Um, that was really the only way of collecting lineage information in the 1.10 line. Now, starting in Airflow 2, uh, they created uh, what was called a lineage backend, right? So Airflow started uh, supporting the idea of collecting lineage information, and the lineage backend was responsible for uh, extracting lineage from the operators and sending it off to some backend. Uh, the open lineage backend uh, ships with our uh, Airflow integration, works with 2.x. Uh, one of the downsides to the open lineage, so for the lineage backend is that it works very well for tasks that uh, execute successfully, does not work that well for tasks that fail. So if you're using lineage uh, or the open lineage integration to try to collect uh, operational data or operational metrics around your uh, pipeline execution, you're going to miss task failures. Uh, the good news is starting with Airflow 2.3, uh, we introduced a new, a new concept that was the sta uh, task state listener. Uh, so the task state listener actually gets events about uh, for every task state change, including failures, uh, as well as completions. And so in the Open Lineage plugin um, that's available for Airflow 2.3, um, we can collect lineage information for every task uh, instance state change. So for tasks uh, successes and for failures, we'll start collecting uh, lineage information from the operators. Next slide, please. So we do rely on uh, lineage information that is exposed by the operators. Uh, so there are a handful of operators that we support uh, out of the box, um, BigQuery operator and several of the BigQuery operator subclasses and the variants that are that have come out in the recent years. Um, Snowflake operator, Postgres, MySQL. We also support uh, kicking off dbt jobs. Uh, from Airflow, and if you're doing any data quality checks with great expectations, uh, we can collect that information and post it uh, into your open lineage information or your yeah your open lineage uh, data sets as well. Uh, in addition to what comes off the shelf, uh, we also support custom extractors. So if you have a uh, custom operator or an operator that's not already supported today in the open source repo, uh, you can write your own uh, instance of a custom extractor. And I'll kind of uh, give an example of that here in just a minute. Now, of course, it's definitely worth pointing out that the Python operator and the Bash operator are not supported. Uh, and this is, a, this is really unfortunate because, of course, it turns out that the Python operator and the Bash operator are the most widely used operators. Um, but it's just 
you know, it's uh, with SQL, with the uh, BigQuery and Snowflake and Postgres, it's really easy for us to just scan the SQL to see which tables you're reading from and which tables you're writing into, whereas Python code is just arbitrary. All right. Um, but the good news is that um, the Airflow community is moving up more towards having a declarative way of uh, writing tasks. Um, and so we're going to see more uh, abstract and declarative ways of writing uh, Airflow DAGs that don't require you to write so much Python code, and also ways that allow you to kind of specify the inputs and outputs um, in an abstract way, um, so we don't have to rely on just scanning random Python source code. Next slide, please. Um, so here's just a, a really simple example of a custom extractor. Uh, I actually just grabbed this screenshot out of our integration tests. Um, so here we see just a single method that is called extract. There's actually two methods that are supported. There's extract and extract on complete. Um, both methods have access to the operator itself. Um, so if it's a BigQuery operator, you can just grab the SQL directly from the operator. You can use the SQL parser that we provide uh, and find what are the input tables and the output tables. Uh, in addition to the operator, the extract on complete method has access to the task instance. Uh, which means you can get access to uh, the XCOM data that's been returned from the uh, from the task task execution remotely. Uh, so one outcome of this is for the BigQuery operator, we can grab the query ID uh, from the XCOM uh, data and then actually query query Big, uh, BigQuery itself to find information about the query execution. Uh, so we can find things like the input and output statistics uh, for BigQuery, we can find run times, we can find failure reasons, we can find all kinds of things by querying the BigQuery API directly by getting that query ID. Uh, and then now in order to use the custom extractor, there's just an environment variable that you have to set in your Airflow uh, scheduler. Uh, so once you've set that environment variable, you can, um, use your own custom extractor classes. And all of that documentation, of course, is on the open lineage repo. Uh, next slide, please. And here's just a really simple DAG. Um, you know, let's, we don't pay too much attention to the details here. Don't try to read the SQL. Uh, we just have a couple of BigQuery operators that are reading from one table, writing to another. One is uh, creating a table if it doesn't exist. And then the next one is just going to read from a table and insert into uh, another target table. Next slide. And then uh, this is the lineage graph that uh, gets generated for that DAG, right? You can kind of see up on the top, there's the if not exists task uh, that's writing out to the target data set. If it, that is, if it doesn't exist, it goes ahead and creates it. And then on the bottom, you can see uh, the insert task. Uh, there's a little uh, input arrow coming in from somewhere. You can't see uh, what the original source is in this image. Um, and then you see an output arrow writing up into the target data set. Next slide, please. Uh, so going on to Spark, um, so this is generally what the Spark SQL uh, query execution lifecycle looks like. Um, so if you're not familiar, you write some Spark SQL or you use the data frame API, uh, which in turn uh, creates a query execution object. That query execution has a logical plan and physical plan. And then those plans turn into RDDs, which end up um, getting executed as Spark jobs. Um, next slide, please. Now, if you're very familiar with Spark internals, you probably know about the Spark listener bus. Uh, so the listener bus is a separate thread that runs outside of the main application thread, uh, and it receives events uh, from Spark SQL and Spark RDD jobs as they happen. Uh, so some of the events, this is just a subset of the events that get fired off, but these are things like SQL execution start, uh, job start, task start, task end, etc. Um, we collect, we, so we listen for these events, and for every event that we receive, uh, we try to glean some information about the Spark application execution. All right, so we can get things like um, the optimized logical plan. Uh, we get task input and output metrics. Uh, we can get uh, data set metadata, such as the schema, the location of the data. Uh, and we can also get uh, things like environment metadata, like the properties of a Databricks cluster. Next slide, please. 
So to configure the listener, it's really simple. You can do it programmatically. Uh, if you're, uh, so this is a, a PySpark example uh, using the session, Spark session builder. Uh, you would just specify uh, the listener class um, in, as the Spark extra listeners, uh, as well as the endpoint for the backend service that's collecting open lineage metadata, API key if there is one, uh, and specify the namespace uh, of your for, for uh, where all of your jobs are going to be posted. Um, now, if you don't want to do this programmatically, if you don't want to change the Spark source code, you can also pass these configuration parameters on your Spark submit command line or uh, in the Spark defaults uh, configuration file on your cluster. Next slide, please. And then here's just another really simple uh, Spark job, uh, again, in PySpark. Again, we're not going to worry about the details here. We just have a couple of GCS inputs at the top. We're going to do some joins, and we're going to manage the data a little bit, and we're going to spit it out into GCS as an intermediate data set. And then we'll have a second query that reads that data set, um, again, does some transformation, and then writes out into Postgres. Next slide. And here's a really simple graph uh, generated by the job. Right. Uh, so again, we have a job at the start that has two input arrows. Uh, there you can't see what the original data sources are off the screen, um, but they output a data set that's in GCS. And then there's a second job that reads that data set and writes out to Postgres. Uh, worth pointing out, every single query execution that runs in a Spark application will report a separate job. Um, so a single application can report multiple uh, jobs, but they'll inherit the same parent. And we have just a quick list of the data sets that are supported. Uh, basically everything, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, we have the Hadoop uh, file system implementations, S3, GCS, and HDFS, and APFS, uh, JDBC data sources, Hive, BigQuery, uh, Iceberg, Snowflake, and Kafka. Next slide, please. And then like the Python uh, integration, uh, it is extensible. So if you have a custom data source or a custom sync that you want to read from or write to, uh, you can write your own logical plan visitor. Uh, similarly, if you have uh, facets that you want to report, uh, such as um, specific metrics for your execution run, uh, you, can uh, you can write your own facet builder as well. We use uh, the Java service loader mechanics for finding your code on the class path. Uh, so all you really need is just a special file in your jar, and we'll find it at runtime. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a really simple example of a custom uh, facet builder. Uh, this is something that was actually contributed by Microsoft to report um, environment uh, properties on a Databricks cluster, uh, so you can know a little bit more about the cluster that a particular job execution was running on. Uh, next slide. Yeah, um, and so I'm running short here, so I'll just kind of breeze through Marquez. Uh, so Marquez, if you're wondering where do you report your open lineage information, Marquez is the open source reference implementation. Uh, there are other implementations such as Igeria, uh, sorry, IBM's Igeria project. Um, I mentioned Microsoft's uh, Azure Purview product is collecting and processing open lineage events. And I recently saw Spline, which is the Spark lineage project from um, some years back, uh, is also collecting and processing uh, open lineage events. So I'm really excited about that. Next slide. Uh, and this is just a quick screenshot of Marquez. So this is what uh, kind of a lineage graph looks like. In addition to the UI, there is a really extensive API that you can use to query information about the jobs, data sets, and runs. And the, uh, the API includes all of the version information as well as the facets that are collected. Next slide. And I just want to uh, acknowledge all of the uh, really awesome contributors who have helped out uh, in contributing to the Open Lineage project. Uh, that's been uh, either source code or help with a specification or just ideas or uh, just opening issues, helping us find bugs. Um, so there have been a lot of great people from many different projects who have helped out. And next slide. And last, I just have a list of resources. Um, so come to Open Lineage IO for blog posts and documentation and other things. Uh, the the resource, or sorry, the repo is on GitHub, uh, so you can check out the specification or you can read through the integrations. Uh, you can also reach out to us on Slack uh, or on Twitter. Um, and we also have the datakin.com blog. Um, 
which has a lot of helpful information about how we at Astronomer now are using open lineage information to help build uh, reliable products for data engineers and data scientists to learn more about their data pipelines. And uh, next slide, please. That's, uh, that's all I got.